what happens when you don't communicate with the sound people. Sorry. <laughs> well, let's all stand. Lord, tonight we just want to come and worship you. Uh, Father, tonight we simply come with songs that reflect your heart, Lord, songs that we know are truth. And uh, Father, we want to come and just open ourselves up to you and hear your heart. So, Lord, tonight as we, uh, as we come into your presence, Lord, as we put aside the day and we just focus our minds on you, Lord, will you just speak your truth, Lord? In Jesus' name. Darkness tries to roll over my bones And sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love and my doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love shame no longer has a place to hide and I am not captive to the lies I'm not afraid Pass behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Sing that again, my fear. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And this power that can break off every chain.
there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me in your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And are you hurt? is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling No come to the altar and the father's arms are precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is called. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. And oh, come to the altar. blood of Jesus Christ will come to the altar in the Father Sing this out together. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before him. For he is Lord. tonight as we come to you with this time of worship, Lord, as we look into your word tonight. Father, I pray that our hearts would be open to you. Father, we just, we give you this night and we give you this time for you to work, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock 
And he's my fortress, he's my deliverer, in him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. and I'm already getting heckled. Oh, well, good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Palm Harbor. I, I feel like I should say this every time I get up here. I am not Pastor Brett. I am uh, one of the new pastors, uh, Pastor Ben. Um, good to see you all tonight. Um, the gentleman, the young man that led us in worship tonight, that's one of my younger brothers, Tim. Uh, for those of you, you might, <laughs> you might remember Tim. He was part of our fellowship uh, a few years ago um, and led worship. So, Tim, thank you for being available tonight. Thank you for uh, leading worship for us. So uh, Pastor Brett is uh, enjoying a vacation, seeing some family, and so I have the wonderful opportunity tonight to bring you guys the word, and I'm excited for what the Lord has given me to share with you, not only for what I've gotten out of it, but what hopefully you will get out of it as well. Um, just a few things before we get into the Bible study. Uh, just want to give you uh, some real quick reminders from the bulletin. Prayer times every Sunday night here in the sanctuary, there is prayer. Did I do good that time? Sanctuary. I got heckled by my pastor on that. <laughs> Every Sunday night. And then men, mark your calendar. The 6th of November, we're doing a men's fellowship. Um, ribs will be provided. Just bring a side dish and bring a buddy. Um, and we'll have a wonderful time of fellowship um, here at the church. Um, a couple other things going on. I encourage you just to familiarize with the bulletin. So I'm going to put that away for now, as Brett says. So I wanted briefly, partly to get rid of my nerves and partly for those of you who don't know me that well because I am one of the new guys, I want to tell you that so far, I've been here for a few weeks, I think it's been about six weeks so far, and I want to tell you my experience in ministry up to now. I had a wonderful opportunity to substitute teach at the Young Men's Bible Study on Sunday nights and I was so excited, it was going to be my first chance to do ministry. Jose, you're already laughing. So for those of you who don't know the story, I'll tell it again because I like telling it. So I showed up to cover. I'm there. I'm ready. I'm prayed up. I have this message. I'm excited. And for those of you who know the story, please don't ruin it. So I'm there, and it gets closer to start time, and I'm the only one there. It's me and Jesus. And then it's 15 minutes after, and one young man comes in, and he doesn't know me, and I don't know him. And so he looks at me, and he says, sup, bro? And I'm like, hey, he goes, where's Joel? And I says, well, Joel's out tonight. I'm covering. He goes, all right, I'm going to go get some snacks. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Just me and Jesus. <laughs> My second ministry opportunity, I signed up for the children's ministry on communion night to watch the kids, K through fifth grade. Guess who showed up? Just me and Jesus again. So I say this with sincerity. I, it's really good to see you guys here tonight. <laughs> Oh. Hey, if you would, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. I really enjoy the way that Brett leads us to realign our hearts before we get into the Bible study 
you realigns our hearts and make sure we're focused and we're open for what the Holy Spirit has for us. And so I'd like to continue that. So Psalm 103, and I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Midweek service. We've already been in the world. We've already been at work. We've been through it so far. And so it's good to realign and just take our deep breath and be reminded that he has benefits and we have opportunity for those benefits. To take the things of the world and just settle down and align our hearts and say, all right, Holy Spirit, here we are. We know, Holy Spirit, that you who has inspired the word, we know it's you who's working in us as believers. And so now we ask as we open the word that you will speak to us. So I'll give you a few minutes now to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to prepare your heart for the message tonight. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come tonight and to have worship through singing, through fellowship, and through the word. Holy Spirit, will you come and inhabit the word tonight? Will you take the words, the study that I've done, and will you give messages to each one of us, how it applies to us? May we take those messages, and Lord, may we put it to use in our lives. Father, we are grateful for this time, grateful for the work that you're doing and for your many benefits. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in the early 2000s, my wife and I, Miss Carrie, who's over here, we were part of Calvary Chapel Palm Harbor back when we met at the elementary school. Was involved in the youth, was starting out in my career, was starting out in ministry, doing the youth, and was excited. And then we had three storms that came, three hurricanes that came through that year. And one of those hurricanes, we decided that we would go to the central part of the state to get away from the storm. I don't remember which one it was, but it detoured and went right across where we were staying in a hotel room. But while we were in Central Florida, I am a Disney freak. Like, I've always loved Disney, and I've I just been one of those infatuated things. So while we were there, I went into there and actually applied for a job as a journeyman machinist, which was, is my trade. Three months later, Disney called me, and they said, hey, we're interested in you. We'd like to offer you a position. I was talking to Miss Carrie, and I said, I'm happy where I'm at. Everything is good. And she said, well, why not just go on the interview and see the machine shop, because you're such a Disney freak. Long story short, I went on the interview, enjoyed it, and I took the job. Part of Disney, working for Disney as a journeyman, is that there's tests you have to take. And so as I'm going to Disney, my first day of work, I am such a Disney freak that I'm excited. Matter of fact, some of the people that I work with would say that I had an extra dose of pixie dust. I was so giddy. So if you can imagine, at six foot six and 300 pounds, giddy, it's uncomfortable for people to see, but I was giddy. <laughs> to work at the happiest place on earth, I remember at 5.45 in the morning, my first day of work, driving onto that property and just feeling like, I work at Disney. This is so exciting. And there was like an energy and there was a passion. There was all this excitement. But what happened is as I began to work and get into the routine of work and being a machinist, cutting oil still smells like cutting oil. Chips are still chips. Machines are still machines. And the drawings, even though they would say Star Wars or Splash Mountain, they're still a drawing and I'm still machining. Part of the process of working there as a journeyman is you have to take tests in order to get through your 90-day probation period. And it's not a test like a written test or, or like an exam. The test is... Here's two chunks of steel. Here's a drawing. Here's some time. You need to make the parts to print. And if it doesn't, if you can't pass the test, then it's not a good fit. I was in the middle of trying to pass these tests, sell my house, move my family over. This was like a venture for us. And so I had all this stress. And what happened is over time, over those first couple of weeks, the excitement that I had for working at Disney was now gone with this fear. What if I don't pass these exams? What if I don't pass these tests? What if the house doesn't sell? What if, and I was spending time away from my wife, I was in Orlando while she was still here in holiday. And so there was all these extra stresses going on and I began to become consumed with the concerns. I got a point to make, just bear with me. One morning with all those concerns and the anxiety that was going on, I've got to get through these tests. I couldn't, you know, what if I don't sell my house or if my house sells and I don't have, I got all these things going on. I just happened to look up. And so for those of you who don't know, as you go through the turnstiles where you pay for the Magic Kingdom, you go to the right 
and you're going towards the Contemporary Hotel, and there's a beautiful section right there where if you look to the left, no matter what time of day, middle of the night, 5.30 in the morning, you can see the castle. Above everything, you can see the castle. And it changes colors, blue, pink, orange, and it's pretty cool. It's actually beautiful. This morning, I'm thinking about all those things, and as I, got there, I just looked up, and I had forgotten the excitement of being a Disney cast member. It renewed that energy. Hey, I work at Disney. This is really cool. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians is fascinating because in Ephesians, Paul reminds the church there of how exciting it is to be a Christian and all the benefits that we have of being a Christian. For those of you who are scholars, you'll know that Ephesians, the first three books, are all about who we are in Christ, the benefits that we have in Christ, and the last three is the application, what it looks like when we're performing the things as a Christian. We're not going to go through the whole book of Ephesians. I wouldn't do that to you tonight. We'd be here till tomorrow morning. But I would like to take a look at Ephesians chapter 1. One of the joys of being an associate pastor and substituting for Mr. Brett is that you get to pick wherever you want to teach. But it also can be a burden because when you're looking at the whole Bible, it's like, which one do I pick? And so I'm picking a text that has one of my favorite verses in it. I'm not going to tell you which one. I'll tell you when we get there. Ephesians, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 starts out with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Right off the bat, we see who's writing a letter. It's Paul, and he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. What we could do is we could take that first verse and we can substitute Ben, a machinist of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Carrie, a homemaker. Dean, an air-conditioned guy by the will of... There's the, our calling and our gifting, the Lord has put us in a place where we are by his will, to do his will. Don't think because that you're not a pastor or you're not an apostle or anything, there's not a calling on your life. I've, I've, over these last couple weeks, I've, I've gotten to know you guys and I've sat in your living rooms. I've, we've sat at lunch. We've sat at breakfast. I've gained 30 pounds. But what I've also gained is insight that each one of you have so many more opportunities for ministry than I have. What is your calling? What did you give Paul, an apostle? Jim, calling. Where are you at? To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Here we see that Paul tells us that we can be two places at once. That's right, two places at once. If you have kids, little kids, you wish you could be two places at once. Here Paul says that you can be two places at once. You can be in Ephesus and in Christ Jesus. One is physical and one is spiritual. I also want you to take notice that as we go through Ephesians chapter 1, you'll see a common theme, a common topic, and that is in Christ. Paul is telling us that this, this, the most important thing, that this thing that I want you to get is that we are in Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I like to think of grace and peace as the dynamic duo of the gospel. Grace is getting something really, really good that you don't deserve. And peace is being in harmony. Journeyman, I picture gears. Peace for me is gears. When two gears don't line up, they are not in harmony. They're not in peace. But man, when they're clicking in together and those clogs are going together, that is peace. That is in harmony. You can't have peace without the grace of God. You can't have. Isaiah tells us that there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Two places and once. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know I had every spiritual blessing. How many do I have, Paul? Every. Just two or three? Do I have the odds or the evens? Nope. You have every one of them. All of them. Every spiritual blessing. It reminds me of what Peter says in 2 Peter 1.3 where he says, His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So a spiritual blessing, Paul's telling us here, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That means that I have every spiritual blessing that's not material, but it's eternal, and it's something that's produced by the Holy Spirit, and it's in heavenly places. And so Paul now is going to go, and he's going to explain all these are some of these spiritual blessings that we have. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So if you were taking notes, I would say that one of these spiritual blessings is that we're chosen. When I think of chosen, most of my stories will go back to middle school. When I think of chosen, I think of the kickball game in middle school. Everybody's up on the fence and somebody's picking teams, right? So this one, this one, this one. And I, had, I have not always had such a uh, athletic build. I was much more shorter and more uh, robust when I was younger in middle school. I was not picked first, believe it or not. And so I know when you say chosen, I think to myself, well, I wasn't chosen first or I was chosen last. But here, one of the spiritual blessings that I have is that I was chosen. That means that my heavenly father, when he was looking at the kickball game of life, he said, hey, that's the guy I want on my team. I was chosen to be on his team. Spiritual blessing. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Adoption. Adoption is a word that means, let me just tell you, I'm sorry I'm so nuts and bolts about this, but let me tell you, when I think of adoption, like I have three children, beautiful children, love them most of the times. Three children, no, I, they're teenagers, I love my children. Joshua, Samuel, and Emma, love them. Me and Miss Carrie had three children. We didn't get to go pick them out, right? They were the ones that the Lord has blessed us with, right? They didn't get to pick their parents either, so still. But if I were to adopt a child, I go and I pick the child that I want. So when it says that I'm adopted, that means not only am I in the family, but that means, again, that he picked me. Hey, Ben, you're adopted. You're part of my family. Now, what's fascinating is that he adopted me. When I got saved, I didn't get adopted in as a baby. I got adopted in as an adult because I now get all the stuff that comes with being adopted into the family. Spiritual blessings, every spiritual blessing. So, so far, we're reminded that we're chosen and that we're adopted. And this is the best part of this verse that I think. Not only that I'm predestined with adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, but according to his good pleasure of his will. Listen, what interests the boss fascinates me. It's a, it's a corporate saying that I learned. But listen, listen, what pleases my father fascinates me. And what pleased him, his will, was when he adopted me, when he adopted you. Does that make sense what I'm saying? He didn't get stuck with me. It was his pleasure to choose me and to choose you. The pleasure of his will. When I read that story, my mind goes to, when I read that verse, it goes to me, I go to the story of the woman who had the issue of blood. You guys know the story. I mentioned it last time when we were at the beach. She had 12 years. She had the issue of blood. And she said, if I could just touch the hem of his robe, I'll be healed. Stay with me. I'll make the point. She went through the crowd. She got to Jesus and she touched the hem of his robe and she was healed. And she turned to leave. And Jesus said, what? Hey, somebody touched me. Now, if she was healed, why does it matter? Why couldn't she not just continue to go? And why do we have it where Jesus said, hey, somebody touched me? I think it's because he wanted her to know. And he said, daughter. Your faith has made you whole. I think it's because he wanted her to know that, hey, you didn't steal anything. You didn't take anything. You didn't slide anything by sleight of hand. Look, I gave it to you. You you see what I'm saying? It wasn't like it's his good pleasure for me. It's his good pleasure. I want you to know that if you're here and you're a believer in Christ, it's not like you got one on the Lord. You didn't sneak in. You didn't slide in, touch his hand, and go, no, it's his good will to give you these things, the spiritual blessings that you have. having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted. I'm 47 years old, and I still want to be accepted. I remember back, sorry, middle school, right? Didn't have the right pants, didn't have the right shirt, didn't have the right shoes, had the bobos, whatever they called it back then. I didn't have the cavarichis or the Coke shirt and all that stuff. And I just wanted to be accepted, right? I wanted people to accept me. Here, here, I'm chosen, I'm adopted, and I'm accepted. That means he accepted me, warts and all. Warts, skin tags and all. All that stuff, he accepted me. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 7. 
So we're going through these spiritual blessings. Chosen, adopted, I'm accepted. And verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Redemption. The word means that there was a ransom and the ransom was paid. Listen, our freedom in Christ didn't come free. There was a price that had to be paid. We were pardoned. I read an author, um, an author in a book uh, recently. He says, hey, the, most, the number one need that people have, above all things, the number one need they have is to be free, pardoned from their sin. Here, I'm chosen, I'm adopted, I'm accepted, and I'm forgiven. I have redemption. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Notice that my redemption doesn't come because of his love, but it comes because of his blood. Which he has made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. There it is again, his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Please notice again the common theme of in Christ, in him. So we've talked about I've been chosen, I've been adopted, I have redemption, I've been accepted, and now we see that there's an inheritance. Let me tell you, the inheritance that we have, it's not your dad's shed. It's a Fleur joke. <laughs> My dad had a shed. He always had a shed. And there was always these little trinkets and stuff. And he was always working on stuff. And there was nuts and bolts and saws and all the rest of this stuff. You know, this is, hey, one of these days, this is all going to be yours. Listen, our Heavenly Father, our inheritance is not dad's shed. It's good stuff. Not that dad's stuff is not good stuff. But it's good stuff. We have an inheritance. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, right? It's a mansion, streets of gold. We have hope, and Brett has mentioned this before. Our hope is not, I hope the rays win. We don't know if that's going to happen. Our hope is in something that's concrete and solid. He's preparing a place for us. Please notice that we have obtained an inheritance. We don't have to wait to get to heaven to receive our inheritance. We can have it now, eternal life starts now. Verse 12. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So listen, we talked about we're chosen. We've talked about we've been adopted. These are these spiritual blessings. We've talked about accepted, redemption. We talked about his good pleasure. We talked about this inheritance. But listen, we also got the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go. Better for you that I go, that the Holy Spirit will come. Do you know what? If I go to McDonald's certain times of the year, don't laugh, Emma. Dad, your stories always have food in them. Amen. It's going to be a feast one day. Jesus used it. If I go to McDonald's certain times of the year, I can get an ice cream cone, right? I can get a vanilla ice cream cone any time of the year at McDonald's. Certain times of the year, they'll do it chocolate dipped. Do you know what's better than a vanilla cone? A chocolate dipped vanilla cone. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go, that the Holy Spirit comes. That means that he, Jesus said, it's better for you that you have the Holy Spirit now. So the Holy Spirit is here working in us. And so this is one of those spiritual blessings that we get is the Holy Spirit. He gives us guidance. He gives us wisdom. He's teaching us. He's comforting us. And he brings us supernatural power. Supernatural power. I also, we also have the Holy Spirit as a proof of salvation. What do you mean proof of salvation, Ben? I think that there's three things. If you are questioning, when I look around, I see solid, mature believers, but I believe there's three proofs of salvation. Ben, how do I know that I'm saved? I think one of them is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, supernatural power, supernatural wisdom, and all stuff. That is, hey, it's right here. We received the Holy Spirit when we believed. The second one, I believe, is supernatural love. Jesus said, they will know 
that you are my disciples by your love for one another. There's a supernatural love when you have given your heart to the Lord. And the last one is, it's not my favorite, not my favorite, discipline, supernatural discipline. Jesus said in Hebrews, who the Lord, lo- or sorry, Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews, I was going to say Paul, and I know this is a debate. Whoever wrote Hebrews, the Holy Spirit inspired, thank you, said, the Lord disciplines, he chastens the ones that he loves. So, hey, if, you, if you're if you doing something wrong and the Lord's disciplining you, that's good. That means you're his. I can tell you that I've experienced that. Everybody else can speed on US 19, but if I speed, I promise you I'll be the one that gets caught because he loves me. The Holy Spirit, one of those blessings, supernatural blessings that we have. Verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Faith, love, and prayer. Faith and love is the fruit of repentance. That's something that we get as a spiritual blessing. Faith and love. The disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Faith and love, again, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Those are some of those blessings that we get. Faith and love. But prayer is an action that we take. I read, I'm reading a book right now. It's, uh, in part of that book, in the beginning, it says that you, we, can't do anything supernatural. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God that does the supernatural work. All we can offer people is Scripture and prayer. How freeing is that, right? So when you're in a situation or you're with somebody and there's something going on and they're asking for help or asking for counsel, that you can say, hey, I can't give you pills, I can't give you medicine, I can't do all, but you know what I can give you? I can give you scripture and prayer. Communication with God. Verse 17. Let the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Here is where Paul is showing you this prayer that he has for us, for the church in Ephesus. And the, the fascinating thing to me is that when Paul is praying this prayer, that he doesn't mention a new camel, or he doesn't mention a, a better camel, or he doesn't mention a building ministry. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's praying things for the eternal. Eternal concepts. Hey, I'm praying that you will have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The definition I have for wisdom, wisdom is the experience of knowledge and action. Let me explain. When I was in trade school, one of the first things they taught us how to do, besides blueprint reading, is they taught us how to make our own lathe bits out of a piece of cobalt steel. So I read in the book, and then I had my teacher teach us how to make a lathe bit. So you take a piece of cobalt, you gotta take it to the grinder and you gotta do all this stuff. And so I had the knowledge of how to make a cobalt lathe turning bit. You with me so far? Wisdom came after I'd done it about four or five times. And then I knew you can't get it too hot. You gotta have the right rake angle. You gotta have all rake angle. You gotta have all the rest of these things in there. And so wisdom. So wisdom is not necessarily knowing, just knowing what to do, but it's the application of it's doing it. So what I think Paul is saying here is, here I'm praying for you that you will have, I want you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I believe what he's saying is not only to know Jesus, not only to know what you're supposed to do, but to actually be doing it and to put it into practice. That, that's what I want you to do. Revelation of the knowledge of him. When we read our Bible, when we're getting to know him, are we reading to know him? Are we getting so that he knows us? Brett's mentioned it before. We don't want to bring him to us. We want to go to where he's at. When I'm reading, I want to know him. We also see that it's the spiritual. He's he's encouraging us. Without the Holy Spirit, the spiritual things are blocked from us. And so I want you to, he's he's praying, church, Ephesus, you, Palm Harbor, I want you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Three things, the hope of his calling, the glory of his inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power. 
please notice that all three of these, it's not my calling, it's not my inheritance, and it's not my power. It's all his. His calling, his inheritance in the saints, and his exceeding greatness of his power. This last week I had an opportunity. <clears throat> we have had some, we lived in Pinellas County before, and now we're back again, and so I forgot about the unwanted, uninvited guests that can come into your attic and come into your house. We had the pleasure of having one uh, in the living room, not in the living room, in the foyer area, and so um, caused a lot of excitement in my house, and so I had an opportunity this last weekend to actually climb in the attic and put some wire, redo some wire in the eaves and all that stuff, and uh, it, was, it was fun, so I haven't done that in a long time. I'm, I haven't done that in so long, and so I'm going up the ladder, I've got all my stuff with me, right? And I'm, it's only about a 15 to 20 foot walk this way and a 15 to 20 foot walk that way to get to my first eve. You with me so far? So I have my wire, I have my staple gun, I have all my stuff. And so as I go up the ladder and I'm walking, I gotta step across some air conditioning vents and stuff like that. But in my mind, I'm still a young man. It wasn't that funny. That's my wife. So as I make the left and I get over, I'm getting to where I'm going to put the wire up. And so I'm holding the wire up and I have the staple gun in my hand. And I realize that my hands are shaking and I realize that I'm out of breath. I just walked. I only walked like 30 some feet and I'm out of breath. And so I'm sitting there and I thought about this verse. Now, Ben, why would you think about this verse? Because it says that exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Does that mean, Ben, that there's power available to you supernatural? No, but it means that I am weak. As I've gotten older, I'm weak. And so what it does is it points me to I need something more spiritually. So what does that mean like an application? That means that when I come home from work or when I come home and I'm getting ready to walk into a situation and I don't know what I'm walking into and I'm tired and I've had a long day, I need something more that there's power, there's energy that's available to me that's supernatural. That means that when I step into a situation, that means that whatever I'm doing in life, that the Lord will give me his supernatural power, the same power that raised him from the dead is available to me. Supernatural power. Supernatural energy. One of the paraphrased Bibles says that this power is endless energy and boundless strength. Amen. I would like to have endless energy and boundless strength. Verse 20. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Talking about that exceeding greatness of his power. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That section of scripture right there, in Christ, in him. And then a reminder that we are accepted in the beloved. It's all in fellowship, part of the body of the Christ. He is the head. One of the things that I've enjoyed here at Calvary Chapel Palm Harbor, coming from Disney, from the corporate world, and coming here, is that there's always org charts. Who reports to who, and how does it go up the chain? It's never been shown to me. I've never seen it. But I can tell you, an org chart at Calvary Chapel Palm Harbor probably looks like this. Jesus, the rest of us. Did I do good, Jim? <laughs> he is the head of his church. And I promise you, in the meetings, in the prayer meetings, and the things that I've been involved in with the leadership here, he is the head of this church. And it's exciting to be part of that. Thank you. He fills all in all. So to me, what it says that Jesus is the head of the church. I know that he's in charge. I know that we are his body. So if I were to go in the throne, and in my mind, my vivid imagination, we didn't have TV in our house until I was in middle school. So when I picture the throne room of heaven, I picture God the Father sitting on his throne, right? And then he has this picture frame right there. I'm adopted. We are adopted. We're his kids. And so there's a picture frame of his kids, right? All good dads have a picture. So there's a picture of his kids. And the picture frame says, world's best dad, right? But if you look to his right, that's where the sun is, and it's the same picture, and this is his bride, this is the body, same picture, right? He's the head of the church. Chapter 2. And you he made alive 
who were dead in trespass and sin. Paul's writing to the church. He's writing to us. He's writing to Ephesus, but he's writing to us. And for, for me, when I read this verse and it says, and you, and all of a sudden, I have it circled in my Bible because it means now it's going to get personal. You. I know you guys are more spiritual than this and you never do this, but I can tell you that there's been times where I've been in a Bible study or I've been part of a fellowship or I've been a part of teaching and I'm like, oh, that's really good. I wonder if my wife's taking notes. Maybe if I leaned across and underlined it in her Bible. Hey, you got your pen out? Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, that's really good. That's good for Bubba or Charlene or somebody. That's good for this one. But here Paul says, hey, you, you, you personally, you. We went to the Deep South Men's Conference in South Carolina. I was blessed. It's the first time I've been to a men's conference in I don't know how many years. I think Promise Keepers was the last one I went to. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that from the pulpit. So that's Brett Robinson at ccpalmharbor.org. <laughs> but I was blessed. Here we are. Uh, there's a handful of us from Calvary Chapel, Palm Harbor. It's a great time of fellowship. But in one of the first opening nights, they asked for us as pastors to stand. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's still new for me to be a pastor. Like I still, it's it just, I don't know. It's just, I, I wasn't going to stand. So they have these guys, you know, these these senior pastors and these big wigs, you know, and they're all standing up, and so I'm not going to stand up. I'm refusing to stand up. So I'm slouching down in my chair, and the Holy Spirit is poking me, a.k.a. Dave Negri. you got to stand up. you got to stand up. <laughs> I don't want to stand up, Dave. <laughs> my turn came, and I stood up, and I said my name, you know, and I sat back down, you know, faces red, sweating real bad, nervous, had to stand up for all these four or 500 people. Listen, I'm in South Carolina. We're at this men's conference, three or 400 people, and it gets done, like, towards the end of that session. And this gentleman comes walking up. And he's waiting patiently. I see him in peripheral. I'll turn around. And it's this friend of the family. I'm not going to say his name. I don't think it matters. I haven't seen this gentleman in 20-some years. But when my family first moved, when my dad went out of the ministry, moved to Largo, Florida, back when I was 14, 13 years old, this man and his family was there for us and loved on us and encouraged us. And there was a time when I strayed from the Lord bad. I rebelled outwardly, and I'm not going to go into it because I don't want to glorify that life. But this, this man prayed for me and for my family, for my mom and for my dad. There was a time where I was, it was so rough that my mom made me go work with him at his job to get out of the house during the summer. And here this guy is standing here. So afterwards, I'm like, I believe in divine appointments. So I'm like, Lord, why would you bring this guy here tonight? It was encouraging. It was exciting to see this man of God and it reminded all that stuff. And it was like he was telling me, you... We're dead in your sins. Do you remember where you were at when you were 14, 15 years old before my grace came and found you? You. He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead things stink. I found one of these unwanted guests. And let me just tell you, I didn't think it all the way through, and so when I released him from the device that I used to <laughs> capture him, I put him in the garbage can next to where my wife parks. Two days later, my wife said, it's got to go. <laughs> you got to do something different. So I had to go in the garbage can and dig this little rascal out. Dead things stink. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. In which he once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works and the sons of disobedience. I know I don't have to say this, but I feel like I should, and it's in my notes. Hey, can I just tell you that people without Jesus act like it. Don't be surprised. How many times we've been to the beach or we've been somewhere, and it's like people in the world that don't have Jesus, they act like they don't have Jesus. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. There's a comparison for us where we can remember where we walked according to the desires of the flesh. But now we are walking by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working inside of us, but before, the flesh was working inside of us. I don't want to dwell on it too long, but I think there's a great reminder to be reminded of God's grace when we look back in that. 
among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. It's a great, it's a great little section, two words to underline if you do in your Bible. But God... This is a great phrase in your prayer life, but God. Because I don't know about you guys, I know that you're all much more spiritual than I am, but I can tell you that sometimes the Satan can just hammer me down. You know, I think of Peter, you know, he sat at that, the Last Supper, Lord, if all of them deny you, I won't, there's no way, I'm here till the end, I'm faithful, right? I'm here. Later on that night, he's in the courtyard and he denied Christ three times, just like he said he would, right? You guys know the story? After Jesus was resurrected, he's cooking some fish. He tells Peter three times, he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter denied him. And three times he said, do you love me? Listen, I think, my opinion, not doctrine, I think that when Peter left that courtyard, I think the enemy would whisper to him, you're no different than Judas. You're no different than Judas. You're no different. And why do I think that? Because that's what he whispers to me. When I allow Satan to get in my head, man, you, oh, you're a disciple. You're Judas. <laughs> Hey, how, how do you think you can get in front of people and talk about Jesus? How do you think? You, you have no right, and that comes in. And I love this verse right here. Yeah, Satan, you're right. But you know what? But God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Rich in mercy. Rich means that it's just not enough to get me by. Rich means that there's an overabundance, more than I can ever ask or want for. Many years ago, Miss Carrie and I, I think Emma was a baby. I think it was Emma was a baby. I was working second shift at Disney, and so I had the mornings off, and we decided the house we were living in St. Cloud, we wanted to put new floors in, and we found out that Home Depot had a deal going on where if you got their credit card and you bought like at a certain day, that you got an extra, so you got 20% off and then 10% off, whatever. And we figured out if we waited and got it at a certain day at a certain whatever, we could get like half off of these floors we were going to put in. It was a big saving, so we were so excited. So we go to Home Depot. This is like in the morning before I go to work, and it was me and Miss Carrie, and then Emma's in the back. We go to the Home Depot there in St. Cloud. We've got it all figured out. We're going to get it. And the lady says, we don't have that flooring here, but we have it in our store in Kissimmee, which is like a 30, 45-minute drive away. You remember the story, love? So I said, we, we got, I got to go to work this afternoon, so we got to be quick, so let's just go. And so Miss Carrie was driving, and so we're, I'm, I'm forcing my wife to drive above the speed limit. That's the speed of grace, just above the law, right? So don't, don't quote me on it. Brett, uh, Brett Robinson at ccpalmharbor.org. So, just, so we're speeding down 192. My wife is speeding by my, dude, just go. And we come to a light that is turning yellow, maybe could be red. And I'm like, just run it. We don't have time. And she looks at me like my wife looks at me when I make those great decisions for the family. And she runs it. And she says, you know, there's a police officer behind me. True story. Lights come on. Emma's screaming because there's tension in the car. So now i got a baby screaming. I just ran a red light. Or my wife just ran a red light. Police officer's behind us. And we pull off in the gas station there. And so he gets out and he comes up to the door. And, you know, driver's license, registration, all that stuff. And the baby's yelling, all that stuff. And... He said, what's the hurry? And so, hey, you know, it's a long story, Home Depot and floors and all that stuff. And so he goes back to his car, and he comes back to the window, and he says, hey, you guys got a lot of stuff going on. I'm not going to write you a ticket. Just be careful, and da-da-da. He showed us mercy because we didn't get what we deserved, right? We deserved a ticket, so we got mercy. Now, had he gone back to his car and come back and said, hey, my wife works at Home Depot, Right? and we have extra stock of floor, I want to give you that floor for free, and we're going to get it delivered, that would be grace. Didn't happen, but anyhow. <laughs> rich in mercy. Rich in giving us what we don't deserve. Not just a little bit, a lot of what we don't deserve. But God, who's rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. 
and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. These sections of verse, he's talking about we're alive with Christ, we're raised up together, we're sitting together. Notice that it's we and it's us together. It's not you. It's not a singular, it's a plural. He's made us alive. Definition of being alive, and I think I got this from Wikipedia, is something that responds to the environment, it's able to reproduce, it has metabolism where it can breathe, and there's growth and there's change. He has made us alive. Raised up together, sitting together in heavenly places. Part of the bride, part of his body, part of the church. Please notice again that it's not singular, it's plural. He's made us alive, he's raised us up together, and he's made us to sit together. We're in the same team. The church, the bride of Christ, his body. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 Speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, verse 16, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What does that mean? That means that we, I need you and you need me. Here at Calvary Chapel, Palm Harbor, we are using our gifts together because we are together, us, together. Danny Hodges, Calvary St. Pete, this is years ago. I used to love his saying. He used to say, there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. Us together. Verse 8. Hold on, verse 6. And raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Exceeding riches of his grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And here's my favorite verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To me, this verse is like a crescent wrench. If you're going to go work on something, plumbing, or work on a car, or do something, you can grab a half-inch wrench and a 9 sixteenths and a 3 eighths. But then if you grab that crescent wrench, it's adjustable and it can fit all kind of different things. This verse is good. It's like a crescent wrench. It fits. I believe that every apprentice to Jesus should have this verse in their toolbox because it's great. Listen, listen. We, for we, is plural. It reminds me that I'm not alone, that I'm part of the bride of Christ. There's no low range of Christianity, that I'm part of the body, that I'm not out there by myself. I'm part of the team, part of the brotherhood. We are his workmanship, his. I'm not my own. I've been purchased by his blood. I'm chosen, adopted, accepted, redeemed. I have a Holy Spirit. I'm his workmanship. Workmanship, I know the, the, the word means to be manufactured. It's poem. It's a poem. But when I think of manufactured coming from the machine shop industry, I think of him making each one of us, going, taking a little bit of iron, a little bit of nickel, and all those things, and he forms us, he makes us into whatever type steel he's going to put us in, 4140 pre-hard, mild steel, stainless, whatever it is. And being manufacturers mean that I might be a gusset, you might be a gear, but he's making us all at the same time, manufacturing us, and he's putting us together. And he's using the rivets and the hardware of his love to knit us together. Manufactured. Isaiah 64, verse 8, workmanship. But now, oh, but now, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are the work of your hand. Hey, I may not be perfect, but I'm his workmanship. He's making me. He's forming me. He's got me up on the milling machine, and he's taking some scale off. He's cut me down. He's making me shiny. He's making me new. He's making me useful. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus, not formed by my own works. I'm created in Christ Jesus. Listen, for good works. For good works. Our purpose. What does God have for me? 
It's good works. Which God prepared beforehand, beforehand that we should walk in them. Walk in them to me is walking is a casual thing. What I've learned here at Calvary Palm Harbor is I can just be in my day-to-day just walking in the things that I'm doing and ministry will come and it will find me. I can be sitting there doing something, ordering a coffee, um, at Home Depot. I can be anywhere. And as I'm walking, ministry will come to me. The Lord will give me those opportunities to share. It's, it's just, it's organic. I don't have to go run and force all stuff. It just comes to me. Thank you, Lord, that as we walk, as I take these gifts, as I take these talents, as I take these opportunities, they come to me. Walk in them, divine appointments. My eyes are open every day walking. We started out with Psalm 103. When we started out, verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Paul here in Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about all the benefits. He talks about some of the benefits. I'm sorry. He talks about chosen, adopted, accepted, redeemed, an inheritance, the Holy Spirit, spirit of wisdom and revelation, the hope of his calling, the glory of inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power. You he made alive. These are all benefits that he's given to us, and there's even more. So Ben, what does that mean, 2000? 20 here as we're in October coming towards the end of the year coronavirus and all stuff listen I just want to remind you that there's all these benefits that we have and so as you're out in life as you're doing your day to day as you're working as you're doing ministry just be reminded of all the benefits that we have in him as his child let's pray Lord thank you so much for your word Lord thank you for your benefits all the benefits that you've given us Lord tonight as we've Scratch the service. Will you give us a desire to search your scripture more, to know more and more about these benefits that you've given us? Holy Spirit, give us an opportunity to share the benefits, those around us, especially those in our own home. Our own home. Lord, we pray for revival here at Calvary Chapel, Palm Harbor. Lord, here in Pinellas County, in our homes, Father, we pray for revival. We are grateful. that you are rich in mercy, that you found us when we were dead in our sin and you've made us alive, that you've chosen us and that you've accepted us. Father, may these truths echo in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, Lord of heaven, that you our prayer tonight. In any ocean higher, 
than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky see now your love has no bounds Jesus your love has no bounds Jesus your love has no bounds Jesus your love has